right. Thank you for the warm welcome. I would like to start by asking all of you to think of the word failure. Now, what comes to mind? What are the words that you associate when you think of the term to fail? And just yell it out, to just shout out. Anyone? Sad. Fear. Sad. Fear. Making a fool of yourself. Making a fool of yourself, yes. Desperation. Desperation. Wow, powerful one. Panic. Panic. <laughs> Shame. Shame, absolutely. Yeah. Heartbeat. Heartbeat. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, I would like to show you the Engineers Without Borders annual failure report. This is a report I help this organization write every year. This is last year's report. This is 30 glossy pages, 14 stories, that prove that Engineers Without Borders failed at least, but probably more, than 14 times last year. Now, knowing that, what are the words that you would associate with Engineers Without Borders and, and the people who submitted all these stories? to be published publicly on the internet for everyone to read forever. What are the words that you associate with an organization and people who fail? And Courage. 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 Helping. Helping, absolutely. Openness, Openness. generous. Openness. generous. Knowledge. Certainly. Knowledge, absolutely. Brave, Brave. Yeah. yeah. Notice how different the words are that you use to describe the term failure versus people or an organization who fails. And it's in that spirit of expanding our perception of failure that this talk really focuses on. And really it's about looking at us as, as individuals um, and how we can rethink failure. And then at the end I'll touch a little bit more on um, how we can take that knowledge and bring it back to our organizations and our workplaces. So, my failure journey started in Ghana. I was working with Engineers Without Borders on an agricultural project, and my job was to develop a tool to help smallholder farmers make more money from their farms. And that looked like helping them keep records so that they could track expenses and revenues and, and make uh, profitability-minded decisions, and that was how they would make more money from these, these subsistence farms. And I loved this job. I mean, I was so passionate about this work. I got to spend my days with farmers, figuring out what they needed to make more money. And I poured my heart and soul into this project for 11 months. And at the end of 11 months, my, my manager and I had a meeting. And she told me that she felt that this tool I had been developing was less than successful, a failure, shall we say. And she had some really good reasons for why she felt that it was a failure. Um, namely, that while the tool worked while I was uh, stationed with the ministry, supporting them to implement it, um, as soon as I left, the ministry struggled to have the resources to, um, to continue and keep it going. So it was inherently not sustainable, and as soon as I went home, it wouldn't be done. So really good reasons for why this project, this tool that I've been working on was a failure. Still, despite the evidence that it actually was a failure, I struggled to see it as such. Um, all I saw was the potential for success, and not the evidence to the contrary. But. You know, my, my team was going to move off in another direction. They were going to move on without me uh, and, and without using this tool that I'd spent 11 months of my heart and soul developing. So I was faced with a choice. And this is a choice that I've come to see um, that most people face when they're in that really low point of failure. And here's the choice. We have these instinctive reactions to failure that are ignore, deny, blame. But when you're sitting there at that low point, you actually do have another choice. And that other option looks like 
acknowledging failure and ex even accepting it and appreciating what it can teach you. So I'm sitting there in Ghana and I'm faced with this choice. And I decide that I'm going to painfully acknowledge that the last 11 months that I have poured my heart and soul into were in fact a failure. And that I'm going to try and learn as much as I can from that and share whatever learning that I can possibly extract from that with my team. So that when they take off in those new directions, they don't make the same mistakes I did. And that the future can be successful. And I tell this story, I tell my story of failure to encourage you to choose that challenging option. And it is hard. It is hard to acknowledge when you have failed because it is not instinctive. Um, but I would encourage everyone in this room to, to try to realize that you do have a choice. Now, inevitably, when I say, yeah, you know, go ahead, talk about your failures, acknowledge them, be like me, I hear two very <coughs> valid objections and criticisms for this idea. And those are, well, Ashley, I, I do acknowledge my failures. You don't need to be talking to me. It's everyone else that needs to be talking about their failures. And the other valid objection is that, you know, I would, but I fear that I will be judged and punished. So I would love, just by a show of hands in the room, um, who has felt like they would like to talk about failure, but, but fear, fear the consequences, fear that they'd be judged? And, and who has felt that you know, they really wish that somebody around them would be more open and honest about their failures? We'll just have you put up your hands if you've ever felt that way. Exactly. I think, as far as I can tell, that's just about everyone in the room. And that's the amazing part about this. Is everyone feels that way. Everyone. Everyone fears they're going to be judged or punished for failures. Everyone, at some point, wishes <laughs> that the people around them would be more open and honest about failures. And everyone wants to acknowledge their failure and choose that challenging option, but fears that others won't do the same. And the only way that I've found to change this is to, is to set a new norm. And that's one where in your environment, in your workplace, in your team, the new norm is one where you are encouraged to talk about both successes and failures all the time. I mean, that's what Engineers Without Borders did with this report. They created an environment in this organization where it is encouraged to talk about failures all year round, not just once a year when the report is published, but every team meeting, every time a manager meets with their, their managees, um, you know, they're talking about what's working and what's not. But I'll point out, even though I worked for an organization that was encouraging discussions of failure all the time, I still struggled to actually see my failure as a failure while I was in it. And this is related to something called confirmation bias. And you've, you, perhaps you've heard of this term before. It basically just means that as humans, we are awful, awful at accepting information that tells us we're wrong. We are amazing at filtering out all this stuff that reinforces what we already believe. Um, but somehow miss all the evidence to the contrary. And I bring this up because it's important to note that for all those people that have ever had that thought, oh, I wish that person would acknowledge you know, the responsibility for creating that situation or creating that failure, there's a very good chance that that person is not trying to be deceitful or, or hide anything there's a very good chance that they actually just don't see their failure as a failure yet. And truly, the only way to unlock um, that discussion and help them to see that their failure as a failure is through this empathetic, blameless dialogue. Um, 
And my manager that came to me after 11 months truly embodied this. She didn't come and she didn't blame me for building a, a poor tool that failed. She came in and pointed out her perspective. This is what she was seeing. These are the challenges that, that she saw in my work. Um, and allowed me to realize that her perspective was, was true and, and valid. And it's only through those blameless failure conversations that we can actually get to the root of, um, of the situation and understand it and, and maximize our learning to move forward and succeed in the future. So I'm Canadian. So inevitably, I'm going to find a way to bring hockey into a presentation. <laughs> um, and I found it. <laughs> so I uh, had this friend who recently told me the story of when she immigrated to Canada. She immigrated as a girl. And she arrived in Canada. And she just, more than anything, wanted to fit in. She wanted to be normal. She wanted to be a real Canadian kid. So she took up ice hockey. <laughs> that's what we do in Canada. And she was determined to be the best hockey player ever. So she joins a hockey team, she starts going to practice, and she, is, she wouldn't miss a practice, she was there every morning, practicing each drill over and over again, trying to get it exactly right. You know, getting her grip on the stick, perfect. Making sure the puck was in exactly the right place all the time, making sure balance was perfectly square so that every shot would go straight. And after a few weeks of practice like this, her coach pulls her aside and says, Amina, you're just not falling enough. It's like, what do you mean, coach? Of course I'm not falling enough. I'm trying to be really good at this. I'm supposed to be the best hockey player ever. <laughs> Come on. Um, and the coach says, practice is for finding your edge. You want to know that exact point where you are leaning so hard into a play, you know the exact point between standing up and laying on the ice. Because it's when you find that edge that you can push into every play as hard as you can. You can take every corner quickly. You can make every shot count. And how do you find that edge if you're not falling? So Amina took her coach's advice, starts falling all over the place. And I love it when she tells the story because her eyes light up and get really big. And she goes, and I learned so quickly after that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's truly amazing what happens when we're operating at the edge of our capacities and pushing ourselves to that edge. How quickly our capacity for learning is accelerated. Now, as kids, we know this, right? I mean, it, whether it's that, that child taking the first step and falling down, or, or learning to play the piano. You know, we don't call it piano fail. <laughs> we call it piano practice. <laughs> and, and we know this as kids, and we're, we're hardwired to learn from failure. But as we become adults, the stakes get higher. You know, we, we can't fail as much. We start to control our situation so that we're doing things that we already know how to do. So we're avoiding failure. Um, but just because the stakes are higher doesn't mean we can allow ourselves as adults to stop trying. I would like to propose that every single failure can be reframed as a learning. And it's a choice. It's a choice to rethink how we think about failure as kids do, as learning, and as practice. So through these experiences, through the experience in Ghana, through thinking about confirmation bias, through Amina's uh, wonderful story about hockey practice, I realized our perception of failure is flawed. Um, it is a choice to accept failures and not to give in to that instinctive reaction to ignore, deny, blame. And we can choose to reframe failures as learning and practice. And it's through all of this that I realized that I wanted to help organizations take all that theory 
and turn it into action. And this is really where the idea for Fail Forward came from. I wanted to help organizations and people take that failure theory and turn it into genuine um, individual behavior and organizational culture change. Because I realized the most important bottleneck was really turning that theory into action. Um, and in the early days, I know it's awful, isn't it? <laughs> in the early days, I'm having all these amazing conversations with people about this idea for Fail Forward. And we're getting so excited about the possibility to unlock all of that latent potential and failures to learn and innovate. And then those people would go back to their offices the next day, all excited to unlock this idea of failure. And they would struggle. They struggled to change anything. And they struggled because this gap is huge. It is really, really hard um, to go from theory to action. We just don't have the tools yet. So that's what I focused the work of, of Fail Forward on. The question became how to help people actually implement this. So this is the stuff you take back to your organization. After two and a half years of working on this and, um, and looking at how to take all this failure theory and turn it into action, I came up with a few steps that you can take back to your organization. And those are to find and share stories of role models, build your capacity to share failures well, share the idea as widely as you can, and formalize the failure process. And I'll talk about each one of those in a bit more detail now. So when you're finding role models, look for people like, like you. Or if you're not the CEO of your company, look for people like the CEO of your company that can provide an example and provide inspiration of what's possible. People that have truly embedded innovation into the DNA of their organization. And share their stories. Share them as examples of what you can do. Building capacity. As I pointed out with my story, most of us have instinctively dysfunctional reactions to failure. And we need to get better at <laughs> reacting well in a way that maximizes our learning. And we need to get better at having those conversations. And that means having blameless failure discussions, looking for the root causes of failure, not staying on those really surface level first attribution problems, um, and definitely always improving our ability to learn and adapt um, to what we're learning along the way. So the third step was sharing the idea. I mean, there is so much material out there about how important failure is for innovation. Find those articles, go to those talks, you know, call me in for a webinar, all to build the understanding around this idea that failure is vital to innovation. Failure is, in fact, a path to innovation. And finally, and this is where my work often focuses, is on formalizing this process. And what this looks like is truly, from the top down, valuing learning as much as success. And what that can look like is embedding learning into your performance evaluations so that all your staff are evaluated, yes, on what they accomplish, but also <coughs> on how much they learned along the way. You can do that in project plans, too, looking at a project for, yes, what, what happened, um, but also how much was learned by implementing that project, and build those into the formalized evaluation processes that already exist. So I'll finish with a few thoughts on innovation. Eddie O'Bang, this author, talks about how the pace of change of our world, and the complexity of our problems, has outpaced our ability to learn and actually have the knowledge to solve those problems. That happened about 15 years ago. Before that, if you failed, you were punished, because the answer was out there somewhere. You just need to look in the right place and ask the right people. Since then, we are increasingly coming up against problems that are more complex than we actually can know the answer to. So there is an imperative here to learn by doing. We have to fail. We have to, like Amina did, lean into the edge to accelerate our ability to learn. I'll skip over that one. Um, because it's basically, we need to challenge our instinctive reaction um, and choose to accept failure. And it's only when we can reframe our failures as practice and as learning and it's only when we can commit to taking theory and turning it into action in our work that we can truly pursue something so great that even if we fail, the world is better off for us having tried.